Today's lecture is the start of the, the next three lectures on indexing. So today's class is going to be on sort of looking how to do locking and latching in the, in the context of indexes. And what this is going to set up for us is that on Monday next week, we will talk about latch-free indexes. So, so today's lecture is sort of the traditional ways of, of doing locking, latching, and index. Then we're going to throw all those away on Monday and say, well, you want to actually want to try to maybe use a lat tree index. And then we'll come back on Wednesday next week and say, oh, actually, no, you don't want to throw away the techniques we're talking about here away. away. You want to add them back, but add them back in, in a smart way. OK? So for today's agenda, we're going to talk about index latches, locks and latches, the difference between the two of them. Then we'll talk about how to actually implement a latch. And I will say for this conversation here, it's not specific to indexes. When we have latches in other data structures inside our data system or other critical sections we, we want to protect with a latch, uh, we can use these latch implementations. And then we'll talk about how to do index latching and then do index locking uh, finishing up. Okay? So I don't think I needed to define what an index is for this class. Certainly everyone here should have the requisite database background. Uh, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, by an index we mean some kind of auxiliary data structure that the database system is going to maintain to allow you to speed up the retrieval or access of, of tuples that are in a, in a table. And this is this you know, classic fundamental trade-off in computer science between uh, the sort of computational costs and the storage costs of, of, you know, of your algorithms and your techniques. So in exchange for having faster retrieval operations on our, on our table, uh, we're going to pay a penalty or having a uh, higher overhead in terms of doing writes to that table because now we need to make sure that the index is in sync with, with, with the table. So we have to go apply our updates to the indexes. And then we're also going to pay a storage cost in terms of maintaining the index, whether this is in memory or on disk. Right? Indexes don't come for free. Uh, we have to store them somewhere. Right? And so this is, the, this is sort of the answer to why anybody always asks, like, well, why can't I just add every possible index on my table for every possible column I could have to speed up every possible query, right? You can't because it's going to be really expensive to maintain this, and it's going to cost a lot to store things. So again, the, the best definition I can give for an index in the context of what we'll talk about here is that uh, we want to think of it as like a glossary in a textbook, right? If I want, want to read the chapter on trapping, uh, I don't want to have to scan every single page to find the thing that I'm looking for. I want to look in the glossary, look up the keyword, and that'll give me a, uh, a page number that I can jump to to find the thing that I want. And that's essentially what the index is going to do for us, right? So the tricky thing about indexes, and we'll see this, uh, we'll see this today, and we saw a little bit of this in the last lecture, is that they're essentially a second copy of the data. And now we have this fundamental problem where Anytime we update a table, we have to make sure that update is propagated to the index if necessary. Or likewise, if I update the index, I better make sure I'm up, that that's in sync with the table. Right? Because I don't want false negatives or false positives. If someone tries to go read the index looking for a key that is in the table but not in the index, and they would find nothing. Right? And so this is the phantom problem that we saw in last class that the different concurrency protocols are trying to deal with in different ways. Uh, and in, essentially, in today's lecture, we're going to see how to actually enforce the serializability or avoid phantoms directly in, in the indexes themselves. Whereas in the Hecaton paper, we saw that they just re-execute the scans and see whether you get back the same result. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the hyper case, they were using the precision locks. And in, in the Cicada paper you guys read, they were storing the indexes directly inside the tables themselves, so you get concurrency control for free. So for today's lecture, we're discussing how to deal with that when, when you don't use those mechanisms. Right? And these are the more traditional ways to do this uh, in, in, in databases. So the, essentially two classes of data structures uh, that you can have for indexes. Uh, we have the order-preserving indexes and the hashing indexes. So order-preserving indexes are anything that's going to maintain the sort order of the key that you're indexed on, or, or you know, uh, multiple keys if, if you're a multi-key index. Um, it's going to maintain them in some sort order, and uh, this will allow you to support all possible predicates to do lookups uh, that you may have. If you want to do a uh, point query or a range, range query, your order preserving index can handle that. And in general, all your lookups are going to be uh, log n. The other class of indexes are hash tables or hashing indexes, and this is essentially a giant associated array that's going to map 
uh, some keys or hash of a keys to a particular record. Um, and for this, you're going to get 01 lookup because you just hash the key and you jump, in theory, basically to the right, exactly to the thing you need. You may have to do some extra steps depending on what your hash table, how your hash table is designed, maybe do a scan to find the thing you actually want. But in, in, in practice, it's 01. So for this lecture, we're only going to focus on the order preserving indexes. Uh, for hash indexes, they, are, they do exist. Like you can in Postgres, for example, you can say using hash or using hash table to get a hash table index. Uh, but it, pretty much in every single database system, when you call create index, you get one of these. And then the, the things we're going to talk about today are mostly applicable to these tree data structures. The latching stuff you care about for hashing as well, but like the gap locks and things like that, you don't have uh, so easily in, in, a, in a hash table. So we're going to focus it, focus it in on here. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the basics of a B tree or a B plus tree. Uh, again, that, you should have covered that in an introduction class. The only thing I want to say here is that, uh, the, just to sort of to make it clear when we say a B tree or B plus tree, those are actually two distinct data structures that mean different things. And I'm totally guilty of this. I'll sometimes say B plus tree or B tree when I really mean a B plus tree. Uh, as far as I can tell, if you go read the Postgres documentation or go read the source code of Postgres, they refer to things as a B tree, but I'm pretty sure they mean a B plus tree. Um, so just so we understand the, the distinction between the two, uh, the original self-balancing tree, or one of the first ones, was from 1972. Uh, and then this one, what they did was they stored all the, uh, the keys and the values could be in any node, possibly, possible node in the index. Right? So you could maybe traverse down one level and you would find the key you're looking for and the value would be right there that you could jump to the record that you wanted. And so this is more memory efficient than the B plus tree because every key only appears exactly once in, in the index. Right? In a B plus tree, the key value pairs are always on the leaf nodes and then any inner nodes are essentially guideposts that allow you to figure out whether you need to go left or right as you traverse the tree. And so the, what will happen is you could have the case where a key could be duplicated uh, in, in the inner nodes because you need them to figure out exactly where, where, where you are. Or if you delete a key, it may, it may be removed from the leaf node, but it'll still exist in the inner nodes, right? And so the, this is going to be less spatial fit than this because you may have duplicate keys. But there, and in practice, everybody implements a B plus tree and not the B tree because managing concurrent access to uh, a B tree is more difficult. So in a B plus tree, all, all, the, um, all the operations you perform will emanate essentially from the, the, the leaf nodes, right, from the bottom going up. In a B tree, you could have to do a split or merge at a higher level in, a higher level in, in, the, in the tree, but then you don't know whether somebody below you is actually trying to do a split or merge as well, and now, now you're gonna make sure you, you carefully balance or manage the, the, two, the, two, uh, the two changes. So in practice, everyone's gonna implement this. Um, and there's some variations to B trees, right? There's B link trees, B star trees, right? And there's bits and pieces of them that exist now in the modern incarnations of the B plus tree. But in general, when people say B plus tree, or, uh, or they're, they really mean sort of like the classical one plus this extra stuff. Okay, so the at this point in the, in the class of the semester, right, we already know about two-phase locking, uh, and we already so we know how to protect the the objects in our database, right? We have shared shared locks, exclusive locks, and we can set them if for an in-memory database. We can set them in the header of our tuple, and we know how to do compare and swap to acquire those. And we know we need to do deadlock detection or deadlock prevention to ensure we don't have any problems. But with a index, uh, we can't just use two-phase locking because that means a transaction would be holding locks on nodes or keys in the, in, the, in the index for the entire duration of the transaction. And that's going to limit the amount of concurrency you can have. And so we're going to actually end up using use something different than two-phase locking. And the reason why we can get away with this is that from the transaction's point of view, it doesn't care about the... Uh, whether the physical data structure of the, of the index changes as long as the logical contents are the same. So what I mean by that is, if, I do, if I'm a transaction, I do a lookup and say, do you have key 22? And the index says, yes, I do. 
Then if someone comes along and inserts a billion keys, more keys, and now the complete physical data structure has changed, and where key 22 was before is now in a different location in memory, as long as I can come back and ask if it has key 22 and it gives me the same answer, I'm fine with that from the transaction standpoint. Right? That's, still, that's still serializable, that's still consistent. So because of this, we can, be, uh, we can do something different than we normally would in a, uh, in a, in a, you know, a regular database with two-phase locking. So let's look at a really simple example here. Right? So we have a, a, a B plus tree, we have a single node, it only has two keys, 20 and 22. So if my transaction comes along and I want to read 22, I do my lookup in the root, I find it here, and I'm good. Right? But now transaction two comes along and he inserts 21, and that's gonna be in between these two guys here. So now I'm gonna have to split this node, uh, move key 20 over here and move key 22 over there, and then I can insert 21, and that causes me to reshuffle how, what I'm storing in my index. So if I come back now with 22 and do my look, or so in transaction one and do a lookup on 22, it's not in node A anymore, it's now in node C, but I don't care because I got the same answer. But we'll see this when we start to talk about uh, granular index locks. This means we're not going to be able to do the same thing that Hecaton did, where you could store pointers to the actual tuples that you hold the locks for or in your read set. right? Because I would have a pointer to this node here, but now it's something completely different. So there's some logical information we're going to have to maintain in order to uh, protect our, our transactions uh, when, when they access the index. All right, and this is fundamental issue again that we have is because this is a copy of, of the database that we need to be in sync with the actual table, but it's, it's a sort of completely different beast. Um, we'll see other issues too, like if you, if you have to scan across the nodes, that causes problems, right? There's, it's more than just looking up for single keys, it's all possible access of this. We need to make sure it's, it's consistent and serializable. All right, so I went through this the distinction between locks and latches at the be, uh, beginning of the semester. I'm just going to do it again at a high-level overview because this was in the paper you guys read. Uh, again, so th this was a survey paper on, the, on doing locking techniques inside a, of a B tree um, by Gertz Graffy. I think it's a really good paper because it summarizes basically the, uh, the sort of standard methods to do all these things. Now, it's from 2010. The indexes we'll read about uh, next week will be a bit newer than that, but a lot of the basic ideas are, are still applicable. So in the paper, Gerst talks about the distinction between locks and latches, right? And we said that a lock is going to protect the logical context of the index for other transactions, and we need to hold them for the entire duration of, of the transaction. And we also need to be able to roll back any changes that we, we make for anything that we have locked, because the transaction may end up, may end up aborting uh, because of a conflict or because the, the application said to abort it. And in a latch, this is, this is going to be used to protect the critical sections of the index, essentially its internal physical data structure, from other threads that may be performing operations at the same time we are. And so for these latches, we're going to hold them for the duration of, of, of the operation. Once we know it's safe to, to, to release our latch um, from a concurrent programming stand, standpoint uh, for the physical data structure, we can go ahead and release it. And then we don't need to roll back any changes because we still may be making modifications that are still actually correct, right? We still may be updating pointers uh, that we need to make sure that they're still there, even though our transaction rolled back because that's still correct, right? We saw this in the example I showed about the page table in a disk-based system. The transaction rolled back, so but we don't want to roll back the, the update to the page table because the page actually does does exist there. So, in the paper, he makes this commentary about. Uh, trying to understand what does it mean when people say they have a lock-free data structure. And he basically says there's, there's, there's two things people could be talking about. The first is that they mean no locks uh, in the actual database itself whenever transactions uh, want to access or modify the database. And so to do, to do this, right, we could, we could use the optimistic concurrency control that we saw from, from last week, because um, that didn't have to acquire locks as, as it was running. But we're still going to have to set latches anytime we install updates. And then you, the alternative is that you'd be saying that when you have a lock-free index, you really mean it's no latches. And for this, we're going to use compare and swap to flip pointers to install updates to, that we want to make to our index atomically. So we'll see this on Monday with the skip list and the BW tree. These are examples of latch-free uh, indexes. And they're going to be, rely heavily on this technique here. 
And so for this, the construct is, of the idea, the concept of no latches is just for the physical data structure, but in the context of actually executing transactions, we still have to use locks to actually validate whether they were actually, uh, whether they were actually allowed to do the thing they were supposed to do. All right? So for our purpose in, in this lecture, we're going to focus on, 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 on both, both locking and latching and indexes. And then next class, we'll see how to do a no latch index. Um, but in terms of no locks, we sort of already covered that with concurrency to from before. All right, so now we need to talk about how, actually, how you actually implement a latch. Um, you know, I've been throwing this word around, uh, but we should actually talk about what, what we're actually, how do you actually do this? So there's essentially four major types that we care about in the context of a database. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the exclusive list, right? There could be other techniques, but for our purposes, the, these are the four major ones. So we have our dirty OS mutex, the test and set spin block, Cubase spin block, and the read-writer sets. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go through examples of each of these. But the fundamental primitive that they're going to use to make these latches work is the compare and swap technique that I talked about before. Right? Remember I said that this was a single instruction that modern CPUs provide you that will allow you to check the contents of some memory location to see whether it matches the value that, that you expect. And if it's equivalent, uh, if the expected value matches the, uh, what's actually there, then you're allowed to atomically install a new value. Right? So in this case here, I checked to see whether the value was 20. It was, so then I was able to flip, it, flip this in 30. Yes? Is this generally guaranteed through virtualization as well? Your question is, is this generally guaranteed through virtualization? What do you mean by that? Is, will it still be atomic? So your question is, if I run this in a VM, yeah. would it still be atomic? Absolutely. So the VM is essentially, um, the hypervisor allows you to uh, basically go raw, execute raw CPU instructions. Right? What if, what if you had two cores execute this instruction at the same memory location? Okay, so his question is, if I had two cores execute this exact same instruction at the exact same time, what happens? Give me like two slides. We'll discuss this. Yes. All right, so, um, so the, the concept is basically pretty easy to understand. Again, this is a CPU intrinsic, meaning the compiler will convert this to the single instruction you need uh, in order to invoke it. If you're on a CPU that doesn't have this, then essentially it'll, it'll either throw an error and say, I don't support this, or it tries to rewrite it as... Uh, with like you know, like if clauses and like tests and sets or not tests and sets like if clauses and maybe even mutex. All right, so the first lock is the easiest one to understand. If you've taken a, ba a basic operating system course, right? This is when they teach you uh, critical sections. They teach you about mutexes, right? Um, so a blocking OS mutex is basically the like the primitive you get in either p threads or. Uh, I guess actually in C++11, you get the, uh, the standard mutex, right? And this essentially just, is just a wrapper around pthread mutex, and this is just a wrapper around a futex. Does anyone know what a futex is? It's based on like spin lock, but it has some like, additional features. So he says it's based on a spin lock, but it has some additional features. It's based on mutex, sorry. Yeah, so he's, he's right. So futex stands for fast user uh, mutex. So... What this is going to be is it's going to have a spin lock, which, which I'll show in the next slide, that you, that you try to acquire a, uh, do a test and set, try to acquire a, a flag that sits around in user land. If you, if you can get it, then you're done. You hold, you hold the lock. If you try to get it and you can't, then you fall back and acquire actually a, a dirty mutex in the operating system, right? Which is, which is super slow. So on practice, setting a, a lock that actually has to go inside of the, uh, the, the kernel is about 25 nanoseconds, which is a long, long time, right? And so what will happen is if you try to acquire the mutex in the operating system and you can't, then the operating system is going to recognize that, well, you can't proceed because the thing that you need, the lock you need, is not available. So it's going to tell the, or inform the scheduler in the operating system that you're waiting for something that you don't have, so the operating system is going to know not to schedule your thread in the future, right? And then when, you, when, when the lock is freed, uh, it notifies your thread, then you get scheduled for new quantums, and, and then you can execute. Right? Again, so this is the basic lock we teach you in operating system courses. Right? So it basically looks like this. I do standard mutex. Uh, I can do lock, and then I do whatever it is I want to do, and then I unlock it. Right? So there's no deadlock detection here. This is, all, you know, this is at the latch level, the way to think about this. And so it's up for us as the database programmers to make sure that we write principled code 
to ensure that we can't have a we can't have a deadlock. All right. So again, so the, this is just a wrapper around this, which is just a wrapper around uh, a few texts. So you have no idea how much I hate mutexes. Uh, like we should probably put a, a script set up so that if you try to commit something and there's a mutex, uh, it'll throw an error. I actually went this morning and I, I was disappointed to say we have a shitload of mutexes in our own system. I don't think, know how many are actually being invoked, but this is an example where we don't practice what we preach. I tell you, tell, tell us that we shouldn't use mutexes and my own database system has mutexes, so that's bad. I know there's one in the netring thread though, right? Yeah, we, package. Yeah, so, so in that case you need it because there's some other external package, but uh, for other parts of the code we shouldn't be there. Okay, so if you don't want to use mutex, what's the next best option? And that's the spin lock, the test and set spin lock. So these are really, really efficient because it's a single instruction to acquire the lock, right? Do the test and set, compare and swap, if you catch the flag, you're good to go, right? So it's, it essentially looks like this. So the, the standard template library provides you with this atomic uh, template, and then you can put in whatever type you want to be atomic. Uh, then they also have this atomic flag, which is essentially just a, like a specialization of this with a, with a Boolean, but it's guaranteed to be atomic. So in this case here, you could put something that is uh, you know, an arbitrary length, like you put like a 128-bit uh, data type in there. But if the CPU only supports compare and swap at you know, 64 bits, then it's going to not allow you to do that. It's going to have to rewrite it to use mutexes or some other primitive. So with something like atomic flag or, or smaller primitive types, the test and set operation on it will be guaranteed to be unique. So, all right, so this is just, a, uh, this is just a, a, another way to say atomic boolean. So we do our test and set. If we get the latch, we're done. If not, then we drop down in this while loop and then we have to make some decision on what should happen, and then we spin back and try to do the exact same thing. Right? So the difference between this and the, and the dirty mutex from the operating system is, from the operating system standpoint, it thinks you're actually doing work. Because right? you're just spinning through here, you're executing instructions, but you're not, you're not actually acquiring the latch that you need. Right? Whereas in the mutex case, you're telling the operating system, I can't actually run because I, I can't get that mutex, so therefore, the, the operating system is not going to schedule you. In this case here, you'll keep getting scheduled and keep trying to run to, until you uh, can get the lock. So the thing we have to deal with though is now is it's up to us as the database developer to make decisions about what should happen if we do, can't get the lock. Right? So we could just yield our thread back to the OS and wait for our next quantum and come back and try again. Uh, we could abort if we you know, keep maintain the counter and say if we, if we tried so many times if we don't get it, uh, kill ourselves. Or we can immediately just come back and try to get it right away. All right, so typically in these in these latches, you're protecting critical sections that that should only take, you know, a, a small number of instructions, right? So you you don't want to set a latch for something that goes over the network and comes back because that's going to take a really really long time. So in this case, this is why this is okay. Maybe just to spin and spin because by the, the uh, you'll be able to get the latch you need uh, fairly quickly. So. Related to his question earlier, uh, what happens if you have multiple cores trying to do the, this exact same thing at the same time? Well, this is why this thing's not going to be uh, scalable or cache friendly. So what will happen is if I have a single latch and I have multiple cores trying to do test and set at the exact same time, what's going to happen is because this is a modifying instruction, I have to go send my instruction or my, my modif you know, do the test and set wherever that memory location is, is located, right? So if these are running on three different sockets and say that the, the, this cache line with, with our latch is in this, uh, this socket's local memory, then I have to send now a message over our bus, like the QPI if you're, if you're on a Xeon system, to say test and set over here, right? Because I can't access my local memory, right? So this is going to be really, really slow because now you're going to have all the network traffic trying to do cache validations and trying to update this and, and acquire the latch, right? So everyone has to go to the same address, the same cache line, and you have the same message to do, to do that. And the, the, you know, the CPU does, does that underneath the covers. So this sucks, right? For simple things, this is okay, but if you have a lot of threads, this approach is not scalable. The better approach is, is called uh, queue-based spin locks. Um, or sometimes, if you, if, you, if you Google this, it'll be called MCS skin locks. Uh, MCS locks. It stands for Meller, Crummy, and Scott. It's like the two dudes that invented this. 
And so what's going to happen here, this is, this is much more efficient uh, than a regular mutex, because we're not going to the operating system. But you're going to get better cache locality than the, the sort of naive test and set spin lock, because you're going to actually maintain multiple latches and have each thread only try to acquire their local one. So it looks like this. So we have a base latch, uh, and it's going to have a next pointer. And this next pointer is basically the location where we, we try to install uh, a, a new latch. And if we can do that, then we know we've acquired this latch. So if I, my first CPU comes along, I try to do a test and set on this. This thing, the next pointer points to nothing. So it's going to be allowed to install a new latch in my queue, in my chain. And then now I've essentially I've acquired the latch. I've, this guy's acquired the latch for the entire thing. So now if another CPU comes along, he's first going to go check to this, try to do, you know, check to see whether that's null. It isn't. So then he follows the pointer to this, then tries to do a compare and swap in its next pointer to install the next latch. And then it just spins on this. Right? So this would be local to its memory. It's the only thing that's reading it, trying to test and set on it. Uh, while it spins, so the CPU is going to put this in, um, on a cache line that's close to him. The third CPU comes along, same thing, check the first one, not null, not null, get to this one, install another one, and then spin over here. Right? So there's no, there's no network traffic now to do these spin checks, the tests and sets, because it's always going to be at a cache line that's close to you. Yes? So, so CPU 3 tried to do a, a test and set on the CPU 1, mm -hmm. since it failed, it didn't send those conflicting messages out to the other CPU. So his question is, CPU 3 came here. It tries to do test and set. So that one, you have to send a network message. Okay. Yeah, you, you can't avoid that. Um, same thing, right? So even if your test and set failed, you still have to send out that you, that you tried, basically. No, the, like the network message is the, is the, oh, sorry, the test and set is the network message, oh. right? But it's not going to validate any caches for other CPUs, right? Correct, yes. Right, so like the, the CPU is smart to recognize that this guy keeps trying to read this thing. It can move the, the memory location to be in the cache line close to this, right? And it does that for you. I mean, there's, there are some hints you can, you can tell that you're, you know, you should move my memory closer to me. We'll see this later with like NUMA control and things like that. But in general, it'll do it on its own. Uh, and then so the, the big thing, though, is like this was one test and set it's not that big of a deal. It's the spinning part is what kills you. So I'm going to spin on this, and that's local to me. Right? So now the tricky thing, though, with uh, MCS uh, spin locks is that if when this guy you know, finishes, he releases the latch, releases the lock, you know, we, we have to get a notification to release this one and say, hey, okay, now you're allowed to go. Um, the tricky thing, though, is if you have somebody in the middle decide, oh, I've spun enough, I'm done, and they want to stop trying, you need to know, you know, remove him and then make sure that the, the chain still is, is valid. So that part is non-trivial, um, but it, it, it is doable. So in the example here, I'm showing, uh, you know, a pointer to a latch, uh, something like this. This is not something real. I'm just showing this for that, showing this as an explanation that you could wrap a pointer to some other more complex object uh, use, using the atomic flag. So in, this is what you get in Linux, I think, also, too. Uh, this is what actually Linux uses internally uh, for its, its latches, for its internal data structures. Uh, as of, I think, 2014, they've added this. All right, the last type of latch is called a reader-writer lock. Um, and this is more common when you have one allow for concurrent readers. Um, basic idea is that we have a single, uh, single logical latch uh, that can have two different modes, whether it's in a read mode or a write mode. And then for each mode, we're going to maintain a counter that says the, the number of threads that either hold that latch right now and, or the number of threads that are waiting to acquire it. So the first thread, first thread comes along, and it wants to acquire the read latch. It is not being held by anybody, so it'll do a compare and swap to increment this. And then now it knows that it, holds, it has access to the, this read latch. Second thread comes along, does the same thing, uh, recognizes that nobody else is, is waiting over here. Then we do a test and set on our guy, uh, we increment the counter to two, and now we have the latch. Now the third one comes along and wants to do a write. It would check and see that this, is, this counter is greater than, than, uh, greater than zero, so it'll have to add itself to the waiting queue here, and it just spins and waits for this. Now if another thread comes along uh, and wants to quite a read latch, 
what should happen here? What's that? Just go and get one. Go get what? He says go get relock. Somebody else said wait. Yeah, so you don't you don't want to starve this, right? So you're actually going to have him wait, add him to the wait queue, and that way when these readers finish up, uh, you you can give you can give right access to it. Now you're technically correct. You could implement it as you said, where you just keep letting the readers go, you know, one after another, uh, but you could lead to starvation. So exactly how you want to implement this is up to you. But in practice, people always uh, they try to have fairness by ping ponging the modes back and forth. All right? It depends on what, what you're trying to, uh, what, what you want to be emphasized, or what, what is what is more important for you. All right. So these are the again these are the four basic types of latches you can have: uh, the reader writer one and the sort of easy spin lock are probably the most common ones. But the MCS one is is definitely a, a is better. Achieves better scale scalability. All right. So now, given these uh, sort of latch types, now we can talk about how you actually want to implement latching in an index. So the most common technique is called latch crabbing. Um, and the basic idea here is that uh, we're going to have our threads acquire and release latches in the B plus tree uh, whenever they're traversing our data structure. Right? And what, what's going to happen is when a, as our thread has a, basically a cursor, as it moves from one node to the next, uh, if it recognizes that uh, its current node is considered safe, meaning it's not going to, any, whatever the modification I'm making is not going to cause a structural change to uh, uh, the other nodes above it in the tree, then it can go ahead and release its parent latch and any latches that, that are even farther up in the tree. Right? So we'll, we'll deem a uh, child node or current node threat as safe if we know that we're not going to split or merge when we update it, and we can determine this by, if it's an insert, we know that we have space to insert something, so it's not, the node isn't full. And then if we're deleting something, we just check to make sure that it's not, it's at least half full, or more than half full. Because if we delete something, then we, then we don't have to merge with our siblings. So the basic latch crabbing protocol is pretty, pretty simple. To do a search, you always start with the root. And, and as you go down, you acquire read latches on the next node, and then you release the, the, la the read latch on your parent, right? And then you reach, reach the bottom, you have the, your leaf node, you read whatever it is that you want to read. For insert or delete, you start at the root, and you acquire write latches on the way down, and then once you acquire the write latch on your child, if, you, if it's safe, then you can release the, the write latch to your ancestors. So let's look at really simple examples here. So let's say I want to do a search in 23, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is acquire the read latch on A, jump down to C, acquire the read latch on that. Now it's safe for me to go ahead and release the latch on A because I'm doing a read-only operation, so it's not going to change the structure of the tree. So at this point here, I'm fine. And then I try to acquire the read latch on, uh, on F. Uh, I can release the one on C, and then I'm down here and I can read the thing that I want to read. Right? And this protocol in itself is guaranteed to, to ensure that no other, no other thread can be modifying the index that would cause my pointer to now go to garbage in memory. So let's look at a delete. So again, you always have to start off with a right latch at the root node. Uh, then you get down to C. And here we're doing a delete. And so we know that in this case here at C, I, if I delete something below me, because I, I, I at this point I don't know what's, what's below me, I could delete something that would cause me to have to delete a key in here um, because I'm, I'm coalescing nodes down below. But because I'm half full, if I delete, if I have to delete 35, then now my node is entirely empty. So at this point, the, this, this node here is not deemed safe, so we can't release the latch on A because we may percolate our change up to A. So then we get down to the bottom on G, and at this point we see that uh, we, we, we're more than half full, so we'll be able to delete something and not have to have structural changes up above, so it's safe for us to release, release the latches on A and C. And then down below we can delete the key that we want, and then we're done. We, we release our latch. Insert's basically the same way, right? Right latch on A, Right latch on C. At this point here, we, we have room to insert a new entry if need be, so we can release the latch on A. 
Then we jump down to G, and at this point we see we're full, so we can't release latch on C because we're because we're gonna have to split this. So we can go ahead and create our, our new node H, apply our insert, and then make our modifications to C and G as necessary, and, and then we're we're done here. So one thing I was point out is I acquired the latch on C, I acquired the latch on G, but I didn't acquire a right latch on H. Why? Right, it's obvious. I, I have an exclusive lock or, or to be a right latch on C. Uh, that means that nobody can read this anyway, so nobody can follow this pointer and see this. So implicitly, it's already latched. So I don't have to. I don't have to do that. Right. So then I release my latches and I'm done. So I think I covered these examples in the intro class, and I've asked this question before, uh, and it should be sort of obvious. But in the case of doing insert or, or delete, what's the very first thing I always had to do? You have to lock the root, right? And so this actually becomes a huge bottleneck now in your system because if I'm modifying the index, I can't even read anything. Like, even though I might be modifying on the right side of the tree, I can't read anything on the left side because I've always taken the, the, the right latch on the root. So this is going to become uh, you know, a bottleneck in, in, in the index. So a way to improve this is an algorithm from uh, 1977 um, where you're going to basically going to optimistically assume that your path from the root to the leaf node will be safe, and therefore you just take read latches all the way down, and then when you get to the, 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 the leaf node, you get, a, you get a right latch on that, and then you do whatever it is the modification that you needed to do. But upon traversal, if you realize that, that your path is actually not safe, then you just abort the traversal, come back and do it the regular way where you take right latches all the way down. So this is also sometimes called optimistic lock coupling. We'll see another version of how to do this basic idea in the art index from Hyper on uh, Wednesday next week. All right, so basically it works like this. If I want to delete 44, uh, I take a read latch on A, I take a read latch on C, and then immediately I can release the read latch on A because I know I'm safe. Uh, then I get down here on uh, G and I acquire the, the right latch. I can immediately release the, the read latch on C, and then I go ahead and do my delete. So I didn't interfere with anybody else that might be reading at the same time. Uh, they were able to, to read anything, uh, you know, the other parts of the tree without, without causing problems. Right? And then the insert basically works the same way. So the key observation, though, uh, I want to make about uh, latch crowding is that, again, this is a technique to protect the physical data structure of the index from concurrent access. Right? Uh, but it's n because we're releasing the latches from our index nodes immediately after we do our operation, uh, this is not going to protect us from phantoms because we're not protecting the logical contents of, of the index. So let's look at some problem scenarios. All right, so the first one here, let's say I have a transaction uh, that wants to first check whether key 25 exists. So it takes a read latch on A, read latch on C, um, gets down to, uh, to, to this point here, where, where 25 should be, sees that it's not there, and then it goes off and does something else. Right? Say when it, it wants to come back and insert something, but, but, but it has to come back and reinsert it. It's a different operation. So now for 20, transaction 2, it goes ahead and inserts 25. And let's say it acquires right latches all the way down, and then it can insert 25. Uh, but now, if my transaction comes back and tries to insert 25 again, it'll take the, the proper latches on the way down, but when it gets to the bottom, now 25 is there, and, has, and that's a conflict. So the latches protected the physical data structure, but the logical contents of the index were not protected because of this. So this is a fan. The thing that was, we, we ran it the first time and it wasn't there, we ran it the second time and it was there. The second scenario is that, we, say we, we want to have a range scan. Let's say that I want to scan of the range between 12 and 23. So again, I'll take my read latches all the way down, I get here, where the starting point is on my scan, uh, and I look for 12, and then I realize that I want to get to, to look up to 23, and so I will, I will know that my balance, I'll, have, I'll record in my index node what the min and max keys are for my node, and I would recognize that for this node E, I, I have a value less than 23. So in order to complete my scan of 23, I have to jump over here and look at this. So 
In this example here, although I'm showing pointers that can go in both directions, uh, in practice, you can only safely go in one direction along the leaf nodes, right? So in, usually everyone always has them go from, from left to right, right? So I, I'm allowed to go acquire the latch for this without having to come back all the way down again, right? Because if everyone's always going in the same direction, I can't have a deadlock because no one, no one's else gonna be trying to come in this direction at the same time as me. So I'm allowed to go in that direction. Um, so all right, in this case here, again, I, I complete my scan. I see, I get all the values between 12 and 23. In this case, it's just 12 and 23. Then I release my latches. Transaction two comes along it inserts 21. Right latches all the way down. And then it inserts it in this leaf node here, F. If I come back and do that same scan again, again, I have the same problem where I'll come down here, do my range scan, and then the key 21 that wasn't there before is now there, right? So these are two examples of, of phantoms. So what we need to now do with index locks is allow ourselves to protect the logical contents of the index from other transactions that could be uh, modifying them at the same time. Again, I said last class, or I said earlier in this class actually, in the case of hyper, uh, Hecaton and uh, Cicada, they have additional mechanisms uh, in place to avoid all of these, these problems. And the things we'll talk about here are sort of the, again, these are the, sort of the classic techniques from the 1990s that uh, some commercial systems like DD2 will, will implement, but not all of them. There's a whole other class of algorithms uh, from, that you guys read about in the MVCC survey paper, uh, the serializable snapshot isolation graphs, from Michael Cohill and was in Postgres. Um, for our purposes, we'll, we'll just ignore those for now. We can talk about those after class if you want. But that's, that's another example of another way of doing this. But that SSI stuff came from like 2008, whereas these, these mechanisms are from, again, from the, from the 1990s. Okay, so these, with these index locks, is, again, the difference between index latches is that we're gonna hold these for the entire duration of the transaction. We're only gonna acquire them on the leaf nodes of our of our index because we don't care about the logical contents of the, of the inner nodes because in the V plus tree we said that uh, they could just be copies of, of keys but not the actual you know they don't actually have to be in the index but then another key difference also too was versus the two-phase locking stuff we talked about before is that we're not going to store these index locks inside of our index right we can't do that because we're not going to know how to easily go find what what locks we hold uh, with pointers and things like that because the location of those locks may change. So we're gonna have to maintain a separate data structure on the outside. And this is the classic lock table that you would see in a disk-based system, right? So you have some notion of, of a lock and then you keep track of what transactions hold the lock, usually the first one in the queue and what mode they're in. And then you have all the other transactions that, that are waiting to acquire those locks, right? And this is just a hash table. And we'll see this is gonna be a problem uh, all the problems we had with regular two-phase locking in a disk-based system that we talked about earlier in the semester, these now all come back if you're using index locks because I need to protect this data structure with latches. So I have to. So as I traverse the index, I acquire latches on the index, and then I have to acquire locks, but I have to acquire latches on the lock table to acquire those locks, right? So this all becomes a big concurrency bottleneck, um, and this is why the in-memory concurrency papers we read before don't do this. Okay, but this is one way to this is one way to solve the problem. All right, so I'm going to talk about five different locking schemes for indexes. Uh, the first one will be predicate locks from the original data system, system R, or the original relational, one of the early relational data systems. Um, we'll see in a second, but nobody actually does this, but it's good to know about. And then we'll talk about what people actually do. And then the way to sort of think about these is that these are sort of building blocks we can use to construct more complex locking mechanisms or locking protocols. Uh, by applying these techniques as we go down. And as I said, this, the bottom ones here, this is, this is more common in real systems. So as I said many times uh, in, in this class, in other classes, I, I love the System R project because it, you know, it's basically got eight people with PhDs in the same room and they said, build a relational database and everyone figured out how to do one piece of it, right? And Jim Gray and others wrote this paper in 1976, which is the, uh, they basically laid out the fundamentals of uh, transactions and consistency and two-phase locking. 
And they recognized that the, there was the phantom problem that they had to deal with when they have indexes on their tables. So they proposed a locking scheme called predicate locks in order to deal with this. Uh, but as I said, this turns out to be too complex and nobody actually implements this. Um, and we'll see why in the next slide. So basically what's gonna happen is, for all the queries that your transaction is gonna execute, uh, it's gonna extract out the predicates from the where clauses, or, you know, or if it's an insert, the, the values you actually try to insert. And then it's gonna try to construct a multi-dimensional space and determine whether the space represented by different predicates along different dimensions intersect with each other. And if they do, then you know you have a conflict and therefore you, you could have a phantom. So if you have a select query, you just extract the where clause. Same thing for delete and uh, update. For an insert, you just extract out the values. And so it's, it's like regular two-phase locking where you have shared locks for the selects and exclusive locks for the modifications. And so you have to know that if you have two share locks that intersect, that's okay. But a share lock with a right lock or a right lock with a right lock it would intersect, and that's a conflict. So let's look at a really simple example here. So let's say I have one table called account, and then I have two queries running for two different transactions. So the first query wants to compute the summation of the balance for all the bank accounts where the name of the account is Biggie. And then the second query or second transaction wants to insert a new record for Biggie uh, into the account table. So the way to sort of think about these predicate locks is that, say this two-dimensional projection is the space of all possible records we could have in the account table. And therefore, if I take out the where clause, I can represent the space here inside of it is corresponds to all the accounts within all records for, that have the, the name Biggie. So now for my insert query, uh, this is actually going to be a subset of the space for Biggie because it's where accounts name equals Biggie and the bounds equals 100. So in this case here, it's obvious to see that these things overlap with each other and therefore I have an intersection. So if I executed this query once, did my insert, execute this again, based on this, these predicate locks represented in this space here, I would know that I would have a phantom. And therefore, I have to, do, I have to make sure that, uh, that, that either one of these transactions abort, because otherwise, scheduling them or executing them would violate serializable ordering. All right, so this is really simple, simple to reason about. And imagine if you have a ton of, of attributes and very complex, um, very complex queries, then trying to figure this out on the fly as you execute queries and, and, and determine whether transactions are allowed to finish can be quite expensive. So this is why they, they never actually implemented it and nobody, nobody else actually implemented it. So now the precision locks from Hyper that we talked about last class, this essentially is a simplification of predicate locks. So what we're doing here is we're actually taking two predicates and seeing when they overlap. In the case of precision locks, all they had to do was look at all the queries that your transaction executed generate a tree, and then they don't need to look at other predicates of other queries, they just look at the actual values that, uh, of the attributes that were modified in those delta records, and then map them to the tree to see whether they evaluate to true or not. Right, sort of a simplification of, of these predicate locks. Um, in the case of predicate locks also too, the one advantage is that you can just look logically at the, at the query itself without, without actually having to run it determine whether you have a conflict. That's not true for all possible queries, um, but for uh, if, as long as you don't have nested queries, th this is true. Um, if you have nested queries, it gets tricky because the output of the inner query could be used as a predicate in, in the outer query, and so you don't know what that actually is until you actually run the query. Um, so handling that in predicate locks, I, I don't think is, is possible or trivial to do either. So that's why nobody actually does this. So instead, the techniques we're gonna talk about are gonna be uh, acquiring locks on the indexes as queries run, right? Whereas these can be computed offline for all the locking techniques we'll talk about next, they have to be computed online as, as the transactions are running. So the most primitive type of lock you can have in your index is called a key value lock. And essentially this is just a lock that covers a single key, right? So I can have a, a transaction that says I wanna lock key 14. And this basically means that nobody else can, can delete it because you hold the lock for it. Uh, likewise, say you, if, if you want to be able to insert something later on with the exact same key, you can have a virtual key lock, key value lock that says, I don't have 14 yet, but I will, but I, so I, therefore I hold the lock on it. And there's another example why you can't store this directly inside of the index because uh, you know, if, if 14 doesn't actually exist, where do you maintain that, that lock? 
right? And technically, the, the, the space of this is, is, is of all, all your keys is, is you know, to the low value and, and high value. And if you had to maintain a slot for every single possible key, key value you could have in order to acquire a, a, a virtual lock for it later on, that's going to be uh, tricky to do. All right, so now we can start building on top of this. So in addition to locking exact values that either exist and don't exist in the key value lock, we can have what's called a gap lock that allows us to uh, a transaction to acquire the lock in between two keys uh, that do exist. Um, and I want to acquire the, the position in, in between it. So in this case here, I can acquire a, a gap lock between 14 and 16 to be here. So it's basically the range 14, 16 exclusive. So if anybody tries to insert anything like 15 or any, any you know, some decimal variation of 15, they can't do that because another transaction will hold the gap lock for this. All right, so again, the, the, this, the size of these gaps are infinite, and so you can't store them directly in the index node. We then, there may be a split or a merge, and therefore, the, what used to be a gap in this node may now be a gap in another node. So that's why I have to have a centralized data structure in my lock table in order to maintain these things. All right, so now we can build upon this even further and now combine the key value locks and the gap locks and make what are called key range locks. And it's essentially basically saying that you're taking a key that does appear in, in, your, in your relation or your key space, and then you're going to acquire a lock on that, as well as the gap lock either that precedes it or uh, succeeds it, either comes before and after. And so for this, we're now going to be able to find, do more complicated things like define what lock mode we want to allow us to increase the amount of com uh, commutativity we can have. So in my two other examples, the gap locks and key value locks, I just assumed they were exclusive locks. But now we can start doing things like having shared locks and exclusive locks and intention locks to provide further hints to other transactions to say what we're actually trying to do with the, the, the things that we're holding the locks for. So it sort of looks like this, right? So I can, I can acquire a, a next key lock on 14 as well as the gap that comes after it. So it's, I held the lock from 14 to anything that appears less than 16. Um, I also can go the other direction with a prior key lock where I can say I'm taking 14 and anything less than that up, up until 12 exclusive. So you have to actually implement this either one way or the other. You either have need to have prior key locks or next key locks. You can't mix them. In practice, as far as I know, everyone always implements as next key locks. Uh, I know my SQL does this. I think this is just because, you know, at least in like, you know, the you know, West, Western, Western in Europe, in America, whatever, we read from left and right. So we, we scan from left and right. So I think that's why everybody always implements it this way. But there's nothing scientific that says you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go in this other direction, right? But you have to pick one or the other. Um, again, same thing. If we have artificial values uh, that don't ex exist yet, but we want to actually acquire the lock for them, uh, then we need to have uh, virtual keys. All right, so now with the, well, now with the key range locks, uh, we can expand our modes even further to do more complex things. So instead of just acquiring you know, a, a key value or, or, or a, a next key lock in shared mode or exclusive mode, uh, I can now combine them together uh, and actually acquire locks on, or latches on the actual pages themselves. Oh, sorry, locks on the pages. So with hierarchical locking, it's exactly the same stuff we talked about before with multigranular locking in, or two-phase locking in the intro class, where instead of just saying I have, again, a shared lock or exclusive lock on, on individual objects or elements in my, in my key, I can now have intention locks at the higher level elements. So what I mean by that is now I can acquire a, uh, a range lock in intention exclusive mode for, for the, the, the range from 10 to, to the gap right before 16. Right? And then inside of this, now I can acquire an exclusive lock for uh, this range in here. And that's compatible with, with my, because if I, if I hold this, then I, I can acquire this down below it. So now what can happen here is another transaction thread can come along, and it can also acquire an intention exclusive lock for this range here, but then it can acquire an a exclusive lock for an a, a, a individual key that does not conflict with this one, and this is perfectly fine. And, we, and this, what the intention 
uh, lock mode allows us to do is it's a hint to other threads that may come along that may say, oh, I want to read something in this range, uh, but that won't be compatible with intention exclusive. So I know that uh, I'm not even trying to bother locking this um, because I, I'm not going to be able to get it. So these intention locks are going to allow us to minimize the amount of time, the, amount of, the number of times we have to go into the lock table and say, hey, I need to acquire something. So let's say I, if I wanted to get an exclusive lock on all these values, um, I would have to make an individual request in my lock table for every single key and every single gap. But if I can acquire an intention lock on a higher range of things, then it's one lookup in the lock table and say, hey, am I allowed to acquire this? If yes, I'm done. If no, then I, I know that somebody else is doing something and there's a conflict. So as I said, the lock table is not free. And we want to minimize the number of times we have to go into this, but we, there's a trade-off to making sure that we don't acquire too many locks that would prevent uh, concurrency and parallelism. So these intention locks are a way to provide hints to others about what we're doing without having to, to sacrifice parallelism. So again, we can use these, uh, these different types of index locks to protect our ranges that we scan, protect keys that we read, uh, protect uh, or keys that we read or did not read, uh, and so that when we go to then validate our transaction, we know that nobody else could have modified our range or caused a phantom for us because they would not have been able to acquire the locks, and therefore I know that I'll be serializable. In the case of Cicada, they don't have to do this because the nodes are inside the index, sorry, the nodes are inside the tables, you're already guaranteeing serializable ordering of your, for your transactions on the, the data tables themselves, and therefore that, that you automatically get that protection for your index nodes. In the case of Hecaton, again, they would just scan this over, scan the exact same query, scan the exact same range again, see whether they get back the same result, and if you do, you know that nobody else inserted something or deleted something, so therefore you are uh, serializable. You're good to go. Okay, so any questions about this? So as far as I know, no in-memory database does this, does any of these things. This is only being done in, in sort of the commercial disk-based systems. Okay? All right, so to finish up, uh, the, the hierarchical locking is, provides basically predicate locks without the complication of dealing with that multidimensional space. Right? It's allowing us to lock ranges in our index and in our key space to prevent somebody else from deleting or inserting something in that. And again, the difference between this, this explicit index locking versus the predicate locking is that predicate locking can be done before you run the query. All these other techniques have to be done as you run the query or as you access the index. Right? And then the latching techniques that we talked about before is allows us to ensure that we're going to always have a consistent data structure. So the, in the case of Peloton, we don't actually do any of this. Uh, so we actually are not serializable. So if you actually had a range scan on us, we, we, we bas or basically snaps to isolation. Um, in the MVCC survey paper you guys read, they talk about running everything at serializable isolation level, but that just means that uh, the way the student wrote the, wrote the benchmarks is that there was never any range scans, so you, you, you were never not serializable, right? Which, whatever. Okay. All right, so next class, what are we going to talk about? So we're going to talk more about indexes. So I'm going to first start off talking about different ways to represent the actual values of, of data inside of your index. Um, I'll spend some time talking about how to do memory allocation and garbage collection, because you'll need this for this, the, the, sec the second project. And then we'll go through sort of three different data structures for in-memory databases. So T-trees are the original in-memory data structure that people developed in the 1980s. Uh, Oracle times 10 used this in the 1990s. But nobody actually does this now, and this is actually the exact opposite of what you wanted to use in an in-memory database. And this is because the hardware has changed. Then we'll talk about the BW tree from, from Microsoft Hecaton, and then we'll finish up talking about the concurrent lock-free skip list, which is in the second project and is what you used in MSQL. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Is it because like, it's too difficult to command it and it up? Like only official guys have the hierarchy locking? So his question is, uh, is hierarchical locking in an index too difficult to implement, and therefore uh, only, commercial. only commercial systems do this? So a lot of the techniques came out of IBM, like the key value locks and the gap locks, 
was from the Ares project, so that made it a DB2. Um, I actually don't know what, how MySQL uh, enforces serializability. Postgres does, it, does the SSI graphs, which is something different, um, and Oracle doesn't provide serializability. Um, I would say in general, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, it's hard to get this correct, and again, for some systems, they don't say we're not even going to bother serializable, so they don't do it. But again, the, the, it, all those in-memory guys we talked about last class all, all provide serializable isolation, but they just don't do it this way. All right, guys. Uh, see you on Monday. Take care. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze as I skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Red still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with St. Ives